Welcome back to How I Watch Fights, episode number four, part two, with Mike Jeans of BetMMA.Tips. In the first part of this video, we looked at how Mike got into handicapping and some basic advice. I basically had him answer all of the same questions I usually have the other three handicappers I've done in this series answer. In this video, we're going to do a deep dive into the topic of MMA statistics. I'm very interested in statistics as I feel like they give a lot of insights that we wouldn't naturally have, and Mike has the biggest database of MMA statistics out there, so this was totally a chance for me to nerd out and ask all of the dumb questions I have about MMA statistics to someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Let's get started. So the first question I wanted to ask Mike was why he thought statistics were important because there's a lot of really smart handicappers out there like Luca Fury, Sean Carey, uh, Dan Levy, and Kelton who don't really spend too much time looking at statistics. And I wanted to know why he felt like that was a gap that needed to be filled with BetMMA.tips. His answer was that statistics don't have preconceived notions, while the betting market does. For example, with underdogs' preconceived notions, whether it's that a guy's a bad wrestler or has a bad chin or whatever, drag the line away from where it should be, which is compounded by casual bettors who just kind of throw their money on the favorites and see what happens. I asked Mike if he had a background in data, and he said he had a year of data analysis after school, but he really just had confidence that there would be statistical trends and wanted to gather a lot of data. I asked Mike what his advice would be for beginning bettors who wanted to learn to incorporate statistics into their MMA betting, because for me, when I first found BetMMA.tips, I found a lot of information, but I didn't really know how to use it, so I wanted to ask him what someone who just logs on to BetMMA.tips or Fightmetric or whatever should do and start looking at. And he recommended starting here with this chart of dogs versus favorites and what odds ranges win at what percentage. So here you're seeing what odds ranges overperform the expected value and what odds ranges underperform. And there's a lot of really interesting numbers there. So he recommends this as the first step. The second thing Mike recommended was playing around with the fight statistic filter page here. You will need to create an account for betmma.tips in order to do this, but he suggests coming up with a hypothesis such as, are fights between UFC debutants, fighters making their debut in the UFC, more likely to go to decision in their debut? And you can use the filters here to see what the return on investment would be in various weight classes for that situation. Fun fact, at flyweight, if both guys making their debut are coming off a loss, it goes to decision 83% of the time. If neither was coming off a loss, it goes to decision 60% of the time. Mike also recommended using the filters with the over-under page here, which will show you things like betting the over 1.5 rounds in heavyweight fights is currently returning a 20% return on investment. Besides just using the tools to research data, I wanted to get some specific answers to some statistical questions I had myself, and I'm nothing if not opportunistic in getting a chance to get my own questions answered on these, so I wanted to know what the most overrated statistic for betting was, and Mike gave me two. He said number one was height and reach, which made sense to me because there's a difference between having a reach advantage and being able to use it, hashtag Stefan Struve, and also missing weight. If you look at the MMA statistics that are given out uh, in that Fightnomics book, it says that the percentage of guys who lose fights after missing weight is way higher than the actual statistics bear out here in Mike's work. So you can't just blindly bet on guys who miss weight, which actually goes back to something that Dan Levy said in our interview, which was the idea that there are two types of missing weight. There's the missing weight where the guy messed up and his diet was all over the place and he tried to make weight and it was a really arduous journey to make weight and he failed like Anthony Pettis. Or there's the guys who 
kind of just give up on the weight cut and take the fine and show up in good spirits and, and ready to fight like Alex Cowboy Oliveira. So that makes sense also that missing weight does not always bear out to be profitable. I should mention that Mike has a bet bot coming out, and he's actually testing it on betmma.tips right now. So he couldn't give me all of the statistics he uses because obviously proprietary information and whatnot. But I asked him what he looked at before placing a bet, and he said everything, and then replied that takedown defense percentage and strikes absorbed per minute are big red flags to look out for. So a guy or a girl with bad takedown defense and guy or girl who takes a lot of strikes per minute things to avoid when looking to place a bet. Another great point Mike made was that you have to look at things in combination rather than in isolation when it comes to MMA statistics. So you want to make sure that you're looking in th- at things in relation to the styles make fights idea, which of course supersedes everything. One statistic that gets tossed around a lot in the literature out there on MMA statistics right now, especially for gambling, is the idea of winning percentage and finishing percentage. So I wanted to ask Mike what he thought about these, and he said that he doesn't put any stock at all in winning percentage or record, even though he notes that he missed out on the Diego Sanchez over Martin Marcin held bet because of Diego's recent record. In terms of finishing percentage, he said that a high finishing percentage often provides the chance to bet on going to a decision at an inflated price. He mentioned that you have to hope that there's enough tape available that you can actually draw some conclusions, but he gave Saparov as an example of someone who you could see had crappy striking and a bad chin, but kept finishing people in the first round, which led to an inflated decision price bet. Another thing I wanted to know about was knockdown rate. It's another statistic that's bandied about by like the Fightnomics guy and and some other guys who talk about MMA statistics but don't actually give that much information unless you already have a high knowledge base to begin with. So I asked Mike about the knockdown rate and he said it's very important. He wrote, if someone's been knocked down, it better be by someone who gets a lot of knockdowns on other people too if I'm going to bet on them. Lastly, we discussed takedown defense percentage, and Mike said that it's important to add context to this stat by seeing who attempted the takedowns, what positions they were in, and digging through a few levels of statistics by watching tape. He cited Anthony Johnson as an example since he stuffed 8 of 8 takedowns versus Phil Davis only to get taken down easily by Daniel Cormier because it was a different kind of takedown from a higher level wrestler. Mike wanted to make it clear that tape analysis and the idea that styles make fights are more important than statistics, but he does use statistics to look for trends on everything from odds ranges to a million other different things in order to make the best possible decisions. Mike gave me a lot of really cool stuff that I didn't know where to put in this two-part video series, so I want to just sort out some other assorted odds and ends that we talked about. Number one, the clinch tier. One of the things Mike talked about was the idea that in women's bantamweight fights, the clinch has a tier. For example, because it's just kind of a couple of different positions, over-unders, head position, etc., and strength, that you can make a tier of how the bantamweights match up against each other in the clinch and the flyweight. So, for example, he gave the example of Beth Correa, Jessica I, and a third girl that I can't remember— But basically, if I could control Correa and Correa could control the other girl, then I could control the other girl as well. So he thinks that's important and that knowing who's going to win the clinch battle is really an important piece because a lot of the time that's where the overall fight gets decided. The second thing that I wanted to mention was that Mike thinks the age statistic is overblown. The age statistic basically says that fighters who are more than four years younger than their opponent are more likely to win fights, and then it goes um, and breaks down into bigger gaps with 10 years having like a big win percentage, et cetera, et cetera. So he thinks that's overblown, and while there is an edge to the younger guys, he only thinks it's relevant if it's combined with other advantages. Like He wouldn't bet on a guy just because he's younger. Another myth that the statistics dispel is the idea that you shouldn't bet on heavyweights, as heavyweights are the third most profitable weight class to bet on, according to the statistics. 
Another thing Mike mentioned that I thought was worth passing on was the idea that he listens to commentary to gain information and looks for people the commentators are too hard on or too easy on. He cited Sage Northcutt uh, versus Enrique Martin as an example where the commentators were giving him a little too much credit, and he mentioned Paige Van Zant versus Rose as a fight where the commentators were being a little too hard on Rose. He also mentioned that he looks for things like uh, interview tips that the commentators give out, like whether or not a guy watches fight tape or something like that. Another thing he talked about was the idea that he pays attention to gift decisions and looks to bet against that fighter later on, and he's looking for a way to kind of statistically correlate that as we speak. So that's something cool as well because, again, that's a hypothesis that makes sense, that if a fighter gets a gift decision, then looking at their record, they're more likely to be overvalued going into their next fight because people are just going to see that win. As I've probably said a few too many times now, he does have a bet bot coming out, so he couldn't share a lot of the really cool stuff, but he's pretty sure that the bot will outperform all of the top handicappers on betmma.tips, so if you're looking for someone to tail, keep an eye peeled for the bet bot account on betmma.tips. In the meantime, if you want to take advantage of all the awesome tools that Mike has provided and tell the best MMA handicappers around, and me, Join betmma.tips today. Also, if you're already a member or you're making a new betmma.tips account, be sure to follow Mike, www.betmma.tips slash MMA Tycoon. And you can see his account logo here if you forget it or you miss it after this. He's the second rated handicapper on the leaderboard, so he'll be easy to find. You can also follow him on Twitter at betmma.tips, where you, like me, can bombard him with all of your dumb MMA statistics questions until he gets annoyed of answering them. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next week with a fascinating conversation I had with Half the Battle podcast Sean Carey that's completely different than anything else I've done, and I think it'll be really fascinating coming on the heels of a really statistics-focused episode right now to hear about angles and things through history. So that's really exciting and something to look forward to. Be sure to subscribe to my video channel, leave a thumbs up under the video, and leave me a comment, and get excited for next week, Sean Carey, Half the Battle Podcast. Thanks, I'll talk to you next week.